It is great to be with you today, friends. What a wonderful way to start the service with all of those precious baptisms. And today we are in week four of our Jesus series. Jesus, what a man, what a king. So we've got one more Sunday to go. And if you have missed the first three weeks, can I encourage you to go back and listen? Because we're telling a story. We're taking a journey together as a church family to really get to know Jesus the man, Jesus of Nazareth. Yeshua ha Nozri, as He was known in His Aramaic spoken language. We're, we're seeking to understand His context and His culture and His Jewish worldview that He held so that we can represent Him well. If we don't actually know Jesus the man, Jesus of Nazareth, we're in danger of misrepresenting the good news that He came to bring us. And it's been a problem for the church False gospels have popped up left, right and centre. And uh, over the weeks, I've been showing you some images that I've found. Some of them are helpful, some of them are not helpful. There you are. There's some more images for this week. Um, I'm grateful to Alexander Fenter for his book, Know the Real Jesus, because that has been so inspirational to me as I've prepared this series. And also Barzi's song that he wrote, What a Man, What a King, we just sung it. You can download it on Spotify, friends. So look, have a look for it. But those words are so beautiful and so impact, impacting. The thing is, Jesus is our role model. It's like we have the trifecta when we're followers of Jesus. We're made in God's image. He's our heavenly Father. We're filled with God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, when we, when we put our faith in Jesus. And Jesus is our role model. And he is, He's the one that understands because He was fully human when He walked the earth 2,000 years ago. So He really understands our humanity and He shows us what to do. So the context of when Jesus walked the earth 2,000 years ago was that God's people were under volatile, brutal Roman occupation. And there was this heightened expectation for the Messiah to come back, to rescue God's people like He had done all throughout history. They were all waiting for the Messiah to come back. Jesus had grown up in Nazareth and he was Nazareth was a small place, but by the time He was 12 years old, Jesus knew His identity as the Son of God. And as He grew in His identity, with intimacy with His heavenly Father through prayer, through all the spiritual disciplines that He would have put in His life. As He grew in His identity, He took on the authority that God was giving Him to be able to do what He did. And then we looked at Jesus' baptism, how when Jesus was baptised, there was this audible voice from heaven. Everything that Jesus had dared to believe about Himself growing up was confirmed and affirmed by God, for everyone else to hear, this is my son and I'm really proud of him. And then the Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove and brought Jesus God's authority. And Jesus then was led into the wilderness and He had to contend against Satan in a way that no human had ever, had to, had ever been able to overcome before. And after that, Jesus began His public, public ministry with a message that simply was the kingdom of God is here. And he was saying, I am the fulfilment of all the messianic prophecies. I am I'm the one that you've all been waiting for. And Jesus said, the thing is, the kingdom of God is a mystery. Jesus said that, we talked about it last week. And it's not going to happen in two stages. All of God's people thought that there'd just be two stages. Everyone could see that they lived in a broken, sinful world and there was oppression, but they believed that the Messiah would come and instantly that would be God's kingdom there and then. And Jesus said, it's gonna happen in three stages. And He talked about it through parables. He said, I'm bringing in the kingdom of God. We're in this season now where it's not here in all its fullness. It's delayed, but it's at hand, but it will come when I return again. And then there'll be no more sickness, no more death, no more evil. But Jesus was telling everybody very clearly in His message, the Kingdom of God is here and God is becoming King of all of the earth. And Jesus preached and He supported His message with miracles, miracles, signs and wonders. And this was a demonstration of the Kingdom of God breaking into earth. 
And, and also it was a demonstration that Jesus had the authority from heaven for that to happen. So Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the man was a miracle worker, literally. And over the, over the ages, people have questioned those miracles. Are the miracles even true? Were they made up? Were they embellished? Were they just coincidences? Is it wishful thinking? Are the miracles different to magic? And in order to answer those questions, we need to look at how the Gospel writers interpreted Jesus' miracles and what the implications were of His miracles for the people of that day. And the thing is, the people of that day would have had no problem in miracles, miracles of healing. They were not sceptics as many people in the modern Western world are today, that unless you can actually prove something scientifically, then it didn't happen. It wasn't like that for the people of that day. They believed in miracles. They believed in God doing miracles and they believed in God's intervention. It was their story. The Jewish people, it was their story. Their story of God. And they were expectant for spiritual revelation, for angelic visitations, for demonic deliverance, for miracles. They were all waiting for that to happen. It was how God had worked then and it was how He was gonna work again. And there's a difference between miracles and magic and the people of the day knew that difference. It all comes down to having a different source of power and a different purpose. Miracles of work are works of wonder done by God, by His Holy Spirit for people's well-being. Magic is done by evil powers to deceive people through signs and wonders. And there are examples of this throughout the Bible. We can see it when God's people were in slavery in Egypt and Moses came and did these amazing signs and wonders on behalf of God to ask Pharaoh to set his people free. And he got his magicians trying to mimic those same signs and wonders, but they were counterfeit. You can read about it in, in um, the New Testament as well. There's this story with a man who was a magician, known as a magician in his town called Simon. And he did lots of magic. And when he saw the, the early church and the disciples doing miracles of healing, he asked if he could buy some of their power. And you can read about what Peter said in Acts chapter eight. He wasn't very impressed. <laughs> it's not the way God works. Jesus did miracles, signs and wonders, miracles of healing and provision. The miracles were there to set people free. The signs pointed to the King and the Kingdom and people were filled with wonder. That's why there were signs and wonders. It was all pointing to the Kingdom of God and people were amazed by what He did. The purpose of those miracles was to lead people to repentance and faith. We talked about that last week, how Jesus invited people to repent, to literally change their thinking from a Jewish worldview to a kingdom worldview, to put their faith in Jesus. And the word used, the Greek word was pistio, and it means to literally cling to, to literally put all of your eggs in one basket, and that's the basket of Jesus. So we're gonna have a look at Mark's Gospel. We're gonna look at the miracles that Jesus did in Mark, from Mark's, Mark's Gospel lens. And Mark's Gospel is the earliest Gospel. It was written to the Gentiles, to the Romans actually. And the author was John Mark, who we believe was the scribe of Peter. So John Mark was recording Peter's eyewitness accounts of what happened when he was with Jesus. In Mark chapter one, we read, in verse 14, that after John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee where He preached God's good news. The time promised by God has come at last, He announced, the Kingdom of God is here. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. If we want to, if we want to put our faith in Jesus and in His Kingdom, come here to earth, the way to do it is to repent, to, to ask for God's worldview lens rather than our own worldview lens and to have faith in Him. And Jesus simply gave this invitation, come and follow me and I will form you to become fishers of men. So follow me, repent and believe, come and walk behind me and I will, I will form you. He's basically saying Jesus will be our spiritual director. 
through His Holy Spirit. He's gonna form us and transform us to become more like Him. And it's all gonna happen through a diverse community. And that's modelled with Jesus and the disciples. And then I'm going to make you fishers of men. You're gonna join me in God's big story, which is still alive and active and happening. And your story is gonna come and be part of God's story and make a difference in the Kingdom of God. That's what we're invited to. And Mark's Gospel is this account that really shows us how there was a clash of power. There was a clash between the Kingdom of Heaven and and evil. And the word that Mark uses often is dynamis or dunamis. And it means power and it's where we get the word dynamite from. So there's this explosive warring going on in in the spiritual that Mark is kind of inviting us to look at. And uh, John backed that up in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. He said, the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. That's why Jesus came, to destroy the works of the devil, which were running rampant on earth and still are. And there are three key words that Mark used. You might remember one from last week, immediately. Everything happened immediately. It was like this happened and that happened and immediately that happened. <clears throat> he also used the word authority a lot because he wanted everyone to know that Jesus was operating with God's authority. And the other, the third word that used very often is amazed or astonished. So Jesus was going from place to place in God's authority, miracles and signs and wonders were happening and everyone around was amazed and astonished. And there are six key areas that Jesus asserted His authority through miracles. And we're gonna have a look at those today because they are our ministry model, so to speak. The first area that Jesus exercised God's authority over was ruling over demons. In Mark chapter one, verses 21 to 28, we read that right at the start of Jesus' ministry, He was at a synagogue in Capernaum. And suddenly a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus reprimanded him, be quiet. Come out of the man, he ordered. And at that, the evil spirit screamed, threw the man into a convulsion and came out of him. Amazement gripped the audience. And then they began to discuss what had happened. What kind of new teaching is this? They asked excitedly. It has authority. Even evil spirits obey His orders. And the news about Jesus spread quickly throughout the entire region of Galilee. So this demon-possessed man was known in his community. And we don't know if he often exhibited signs of being um, possessed by a demon or whether this was a new thing. But he would have been known in that community. And and it was the evil spirit within him that first recognised Jesus and first recognised that spiritual power Evil spirits are the first to recognise Jesus long before the disciples, long before us often. And it is a reminder that Satan knows his time is up because Jesus has secured the victory. What Jesus did on the cross has secured the victory once and for all. But we're in this in-between time. We talked about it last week where Satan still has authority, but it's not, it's not authority in all its fullness because we who love Jesus, who have invited Him into our hearts and carry His Holy Spirit are there to advance the Kingdom of God and to do what Jesus did. And I love how Jesus did that deliverance ministry. He didn't make a fuss, He didn't yell, He didn't go head to head with this demonic spirit. He just said, be quiet and get away from Him. That's our model, friends. We don't have to be intimidated. It's not us going to war against the spiritual realm. It's actually God doing it. All we have to do is step out in the authority that we've been given and just say, and bind the evil in the name of Jesus. There's nothing scary about it. It's like be bound in the name of Jesus. That's how Jesus did it. He delivered the man quietly and with authority. We're reminded in, in Ephesians, Paul reminds us that we, we don't fight against flesh and blood. Even when people are behaving badly, it's actually an evil spirit that is kind of pulling all the strings. We fight against powers and principalities. It's a spiritual war and it's God's war. And we just have to put our trust in Him and that's where we get our authority. So that was the first area of ministry that Jesus exercised authority. 
through the miraculous. The second was in ruling over sickness. We read about this a little later in Mark chapter 1, verses 29 to 34. Immediately after he'd been preaching, the disciples and Jesus went to Simon Peter's mother-in-law's house and she was sick. So there was no lunch. Only the women could cook in those days. I'm glad that things have changed now, friends. <laughs> Has it? <laughs> That's brave. <laughs> After Jesus left the synagogue with James and John, they went to Simon and Andrew's home. Now Simon's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. They told Jesus about her right away. So he went inside, he went to her bedside, took her by the hand and helped her to sit up. Then the fever left her and she prepared a meal for them. That was radical. Like it was not normal that any rabbi would go into the bedroom of a woman and take her hand when she was sick. There were all these different rules that were being broken. But Jesus is modelling the most compassionate kind of pastoral ministry. He just sat with her and He treated the fever in the same way that He treated the demon. He rebuked the fever, be gone. And the fever was gone. Jesus treated the fever as an expression of Satan's kingdom. The biblical worldview that we hold is that disease and sickness entered humanity through the fall. Right back in the Garden of Eden, that's when disease and sickness entered humanity. Our bodies became mortal at that point through original sin, through disobedience to God. Paul reminds us of of that in Romans 5 verse 12. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone for everyone sinned. Disease and sickness are a foretaste of death. They're the work of the the enemy. And Jesus died to defeat the power of sin and death and sickness once and for all, reversing mortality in bodily resurrection. And it's important that we know that in eternal life, when we're in eternity, we will be embodied. We will have bodies. Jesus had a body when He came back in His resurrected bodily state. We won't just be spirits floating around. We'll have a body. And healing is a foretaste of the Kingdom of God coming here to earth in all its fullness. And the kind of healing that God invites us to is not just physical healing. It's spiritual healing, it's psycho-emotional healing, it's full restoration, it's healing in broken relationships, it's every kind of healing that you could imagine. And so Jesus healed so many people. He He healed lepers and again, like nobody would even come close anywhere near a leper in those days because people were so afraid of catching leprosy themselves. Those people were were actually seen as dead, dead people. They'd already died really. There was nothing anyone could do. And Jesus came and He touched the lepers and He laid hands on blind people and they could see and He, He, uh, unblocked ears of deaf people and he, he healed the lame. All these miracles that Jesus did. And we're told in the Bible that He healed everyone who came to Him, but not everybody around Him was healed. It speaks of us putting our faith in Jesus and asking Him to help us. And that's when the Kingdom of God comes. So exercising power over demons, power over sickness. The third area that He exercised His authority was in forgiving sins. A few days later, We're told in Mark chapter two, verse two, uh, two to 12, they couldn't bring Jesus because, sorry, they couldn't bring Him to Jesus because of the crowd. There is a story of a man who was paralysed and he had some friends and they heard that Jesus was there and these friends were determined that their friend would be healed. And so they took Him to the house, but there was this massive crowd of people outside and they couldn't get in the door. So they dug a hole in the roof above Jesus' head and they lowered this man on his mat right in front of Jesus. And seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralysed man, my son, my son, your sins are forgiven. Now, I just wanna stop there and say that Jesus saw the faith of these people. They had repented and put their faith in Jesus. They had a change of worldview their worldview, and they knew actually in that moment, the only way to get to Jesus was rather than trying to push through and get people out of the way, they were gonna make a hole in the roof. That, that was their faith. So they made this hole. I always feel sorry for the person whose house it was actually. <laughs> they made a hole in the roof and they lowered him down and Jesus was impressed with their faith and He forgave that man's sin. 
And that was, it caused outrage. All of the religious leaders said, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he put his credibility on the line and he challenged them. He said, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralysed man, your sins are forgiven or stand up, pick up your mat and walk? Obviously easier to just say your sins are forgiven. So I'll prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralysed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. And the man jumped up, picked up his mat and off he went. This was so controversial to the, the leaders of religious law. Nobody could forgive sins except God. And what Jesus was saying is, I am the Messiah. I've come from God. I am the Son of Man. The religious leaders would have known all of the prophecies about the Messiah coming. And there's this prophecy in Daniel, which they would have known well. Daniel chapter seven, verse 13. I saw someone like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient one and was led into his presence. He was given authority, honour and sovereignty over all the nations of the world so that people of every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. Jesus was making a statement by forgiving that man's sins. He was saying, I am the Son of Man. I am the Messiah that everybody has been waiting for. Jesus exercised His authority over forgiving sins. He also exercised His authority over ruling over nature. A little later in Mark chapter 1, we're told that Jesus was asleep in a boat with his disciples and they were on the Sea of Galilee and there was a huge storm and the Sea of Galilee was known for unexpected storms coming up. But these guys were all experienced fishermen. So this storm must have been huge because they were terrified. And Jesus was asleep in the boat. Was he asleep because he was exhausted from ministry? I don't think so. I think he was asleep because he was a man of faith and he just trusted himself to God's will. So no matter what storms were going on around him, he just had absolute peace. He had the peace of God. He had shalom. And uh, we're told that the disciples woke up Jesus and He rebuked the waves. He rebuked the storm. It was another rebuke against evil. He treated it again like a demonic spirit. He was just like, He rebuked it. Be gone, be calm. And the disciples all said, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey Him? They were amazed and astonished by His authority. The fifth area of authority that Jesus exercised was ruling over death. And we read about this in Mark chapter five, that there was a synagogue leader whose name was Jairus. Jairus. He was a religious leader and his daughter was dying. And he put his faith in Jesus and he pleaded with Jesus, if only you'll come to my house and touch my daughter, she will be made well, she will live. And so Jesus is on his way to heal Jairus's daughter and that's when the woman with the issue of bleeding came and touched his cloak. This woman had faith. She knew that if she just could touch Jesus' cloak, she would be healed. And so that's what she did. And Jesus, we're told in the text, felt dynamous power go out of him. And he stopped and he, he said, Who, who's touched my robe? And there's this moment that everyone's so kind of worried. She must have been so embarrassed. She was thinking, I just wanted to do it quietly and but Jesus wanted to reinstate her. He wanted her to know that He had done this healing and it was His joy to do this healing. And she was now clean and she could now be welcomed back into community. And she was a daughter of faith. That's what Jesus called her. Meanwhile, Jairus' daughter died and he was heartbroken. He said, his friend said, don't bother the teacher anymore. Your daughter is dead. And Jesus said, don't be afraid, just believe. He said, Respond in faith in this dark moment. That's what he was saying. Like it looks really dark, just have faith. So, and it's an invitation for us. In the midst of the storms we face, in the midst of disappointment, in the midst of death itself, Jesus reminds us, don't be afraid, just have faith. And when they arrived at the house, there was this commotion going on. She was a young, unmarried girl. She hadn't had children of her own. There was all this disappointment. There would have been professional whalers there. Everything was going on. And uh, Jesus went into her room just with the people of faith, His three closest disciples, her mum and dad, 
And just like he did with Simon's mother-in-law, he sat down next to her on the bed and he took her hand. He said, little girl, get up. How tender, how compassionate, how merciful. And uh, immediately we're told she got up. She'd been dead and she got up. And then Jesus said, give her something to eat. I love how practical Jesus is. He's just like, yep, okay, now we just need to get the food for her and she'll be sorted. Jesus was showing He has authority over death itself. And in each of the situations that we read about where Jesus brought people back to life, it's important to remember that they are resuscitations. They weren't resurrections because those people were resuscitated, they had life, but at some stage in their human life, they would have died just like we all die at the end of our human life. But there is the hope of resurrection ahead because of what Jesus did. Other accounts of, of, of uh, resuscitation are the widow's son and Lazarus. You can read about that in, in Mark's Gospel as well. And then finally, the final area that Jesus exhibited authority was over ruling over human hunger. We read about Jesus feeding the 5,000 and feeding the 4,000. And the thing that is really important to remember is He was doing two different things here. And He was, he was not only feeding people and giving them, giving them food for the day. He was actually making a statement to say, I'm the bread of life. And when He fed the 5,000, it was in a Jewish area of Galilee. And there were 12 baskets of leftovers left over, which symbolised the 12 tribes of Israel. And when He fed the 4,000, it was on the other side of the Sea of Galilee in Decapolis. And there were seven baskets of leftovers. And seven is the symbol of completion. It was a reminder that God's kingdom is for all of the nations. And Jesus said to His disciples in, the, in those moments, I'm the bread of life. I'm the bread of life. It was a turning point after those miracles where Jesus really started to reveal Himself as the Messiah and that He would be killed and there would be this climatic triumph over evil once and for all. That was the turning point when Jesus started talking about what He was going to do, that He would give His body, His body would be broken as the bread of heaven for humanity, for God's people, the Jewish people, but for the whole of all of the other nations, all of us, the Gentiles. Jesus is the bread of life. And in all of these scenarios, He just showed such compassion, such humility, such authority. And He invites us to do the same. The miracle of multiplication happened through, through Jesus, but through the hands of the people handing out the bread. Jesus is longing for us to take our part in His story. Jesus could come in and just organise everything and we wouldn't even have a part to play in His story, but it is the kindness of God where we are invited to have a part in God's story. We're invited to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to go and extend the Kingdom of God, to go and continue the mission to which Jesus came. And in all of those areas, Jesus is a, and His invitation was for people to repent and to have faith. And it's not an invitation that happens once where we invite Jesus into our heart. It's an invitation that happens every single day. Repent of my way of thinking. I'm sorry, Lord, for the way that I box you in and I can't see where you're at and I just get influenced by uh, the, the world around me. Help change my view to be more in line with yours. That's what repentance looks like. It's an ongoing process. And then fill me with faith. Give me your faith. Give me your eyes of faith to see. So what can we apply from what we've learned today in our own context? Well, there are three things I think we can apply. The first is that Jesus is our role model. If we wanna know how to do pastoral ministry, we look at Jesus. We know how to pray by looking at Jesus. Just really gentle, in humility, with authority. That's how we do it. Jesus addressed the evil like storm be gone, sickness be healed, pain be gone. And we do that as followers of Jesus and we use Jesus' Name. Knee be healed in the Name of Jesus. We speak to the affliction in the Name of Jesus. And when we use the Name of Jesus, it's not like a magic formula in the Name of Jesus, like we're chanting. It's actually a reminder for us that we're putting our faith in the Name of Jesus. That's what we're doing. Jesus, would You come? Give us Your authority. In Jesus' Name, sickness be gone. Um, you know, I, I was actually also thinking that I think the reason that Moses didn't get into the promised land was because Jesus, uh, all the people were grumbling 
and they needed water. And God said, okay, if you strike this, this big stone, or I'm gonna, water will gush from this stone. And so that's what happened. But Moses was so frustrated that he hit the stone and the water came out and Moses said, you know, you're so annoying, essentially, these people. Is this what I have to do for you? Do I have to perform miracles for you? And he was actually taking glory that was God's glory for himself. I think when we're speaking in the name of Jesus, it helps us to remember that this is not us. Like the healing doesn't come through us. It's all about Him. That's the first thing. So Jesus is our role model. The second thing is we're invited to do the same and greater works than Jesus. This is Jesus' invitation in John 14. I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I've done and even greater works because I'm gonna be with the Father. Jesus' purpose was to set people free. It's our purpose as well, to share the good news, to continue the work that Jesus has begun. <clears throat> the, third, the third invitation is that we, we're called to remember that we live in the in-between bit of the now and the not yet of the kingdom. And as I shared last week, that gives us our theology for suffering because God's kingdom is here and we're invited to constantly invite His kingdom to come but it's not here yet in all its fullness. And so as we're inviting God's kingdom to come, we're trusting the results to God. You do it how you want to do it. And often it's gonna feel like it's slow and delayed. And we're like, God, why can you allow this to happen? It's so painful. But we're invited to trust the results to God. I just wanna end with a couple of stories. I could tell you story after story of miraculous things that God is doing in our midst. It is, it is honestly so exciting hearing the different stories in people's lives, the stories of God. Last week, when we were dedicating um, a little girl and we were told that Eduardo, uh, Eduardo's mother-in-law had visited from Brazil a couple, of week, a couple of years before and somebody had randomly prayed for her. She doesn't have good English. This prayer happened. She didn't even really know what they said. She was healed. And she wanted us to know like two years later, that her knee had been dramatically healed and her, her stomach had been healed. That's God. Like she couldn't wait to come and we were all praying for this baby and she said, I just wanna share this testimony. How good is God? Like these miracles happen and we often don't know anything about it. I, I had a, a healing just last year where I had, I was diagnosed from the uh, podiatrist of having, as having plantar fasciitis from a running injury. And I was in so much pain. And I, we went out for dinner one night with some good friends of ours and they, they prayed for us. They prayed, I was hobbling. I, could hard, I couldn't put any weight on my foot. It was so incredibly sore. And the podiatrist said, it's gonna be four months of healing and you have to have all this expensive uh, medical attention in the meantime. Well, my friends prayed and I, my foot, all the pain went completely. Couldn't believe it. A few days later, the, came, the pain came back and I was, I was sharing at GVY and a couple of the leaders came and prayed for me. The pain completely went and I haven't had any more pain. It's been nearly two years. All glory to God. Like things that are so annoying that no one else would know. I mean, I, didn't, I hadn't had my leg cut off. It wasn't like it was bleeding profusely. It was just annoying for me and God healed it. I've had nerve pain healed in my jaw like probably 15 years ago, I had this unbelievable pain in my face and no one could, no doctor could quite figure it out. And it, when it came, it was just so sore, it was nerve pain. I went to a conference, someone gave a word about nerve pain in your jaw and I went and got prayer and it's been completely healed. All glory to God. Like, our God is amazing. I lost my AirPods <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. I left them on the plane. I did the thing I never do. I put them in the pocket. And then I left and I phoned up a few weeks later after I'd ransacked the house and I suddenly thought, oh, I left them on the plane. And the lady at Air New Zealand pretty much laughed and she said, you know what? You're not gonna have them back. Like it's been two weeks, like you're not gonna get them back. Well then, two weeks later, she tracked me down. She said, I found your AirPods. She said, I had to go through all the records to find out who you were, but I found them. That's a miracle. Like, honestly, God is so good. He really is. <laughs> Do you know the place, and I've shared this before, the place that I've seen so many incredible miracles of healing is in Mozambique. There's a few pictures that will come up, but the pictures show just how simple life is. Where we minister, where we have mission partners that we support is one of the poorest places in the world. And this is what church looks like. And all these people have encountered Jesus. There have been 400 churches planted in the last 25 years. The gospel is spreading like wildfire. 
This is um, the team just praying for some, someone. Just They provided a meal for us. It was after church and we we're just praying. This is what it looks like. There's nothing spectacular or amazing. It's just very simple, laying hands on people and praying. There's another photo coming up. Yep, these are the leaders, Talsamo and Amina, in their, at their home. You can see how humble their lives are and a whole bunch of kids. Well, the thing about ministering in Mozambique is at the end of church, you say, would anybody have any, anything that they'd like God to do? Is there anyone that needs healing or provision or anything? And we'd give these prophetic words, no matter what the word was, the entire church came forward. And that is the hunger of people. They have nothing else to put their faith in other than Jesus. They don't have medical, uh, medical help available. They don't have money and resources. Their life is so simple, simple. And in one seminar with all of the women, I just said, if anyone's lost a child, would you put your hand up? I'd love to pray for you. And I expected maybe like 10%. Again, the entire room, every single woman pretty much in that community has lost at least one child. One, one person had lost 15 children. And they're all white, they're, they're things that wouldn't happen here in New Zealand. It's desperate. But when they pray, they believe and Jesus moves. So we did a conference for leaders and uh, I had this, I had like a swollen ankle from the plane that didn't go down. I actually was slightly worried low key that it was a DVT, but I, I felt to keep on ministering. It wasn't a DVT, obviously. Um, but I just prayed at the conference, if anyone's got pain in their ankle or foot or is lame, would you like, would you like prayer? And so we prayed for all these people. On the Sunday afterwards, we were at a local church, we were ministering and people wanted to share testimonies and this lovely lady came up and she shared a testimony, she's here. The lady standing up and these were, this is what the church looks like. <clears throat> and she said, um, when I was prayed for at the conference, um, someone prayed for me and all the pain went. I couldn't walk and I had to be carried in and helped to get to the conference. And someone prayed for me and my leg was completely healed. And everyone was like, wow, that's amazing. It's so good. And she was all happy and she did this little dance and she sat down and then she stood up again and she began another story. And uh, she said, and Timmy actually mentioned to me at that point, he kind of like everything inside of him groaned a little bit because Timmy and Sarah lived there for three years and this lady was quite well known in the community as being quite negative while they were there. And so Timmy was thinking, oh no, she probably wants to complain about something. <laughs> anyway, she stood up and she said, when Timmy and Sarah lived here amongst us in Angosh, Sarah used to come every week to pray for my son who was born crippled. And she'd pray and she'd bring things like a mattress and food. And she was so kind and she started crying as she was saying this. She said, um, Sarah and Timmy left, but the year after they left, my son was completely healed and he can now walk and he now provides for the family and he can work. It's an amazing miracle, friends. It was incredible. And Timmy immediately repented in his heart. He was just like, <laughs> Lord, forgive me. <laughs> But our God is doing the most incredible miracles amongst people of faith and people who call on Him and ask for His help. And what He has done, He wants to continue to do. Jesus of Nazareth was a miracle worker and He is still a miracle worker today. The good news that Jesus brought is just as much for today as it was 2000 years ago. God is King and is becoming King over everything through Jesus of Nazareth in His birth, life, ministry, death, resurrection and ascension. Jesus, the Messiah, reigns now and forever. He's forgiving sin. He's offering eternal life, healing and deliverance from all evil. He's on His throne, bringing justice to the oppressed, putting things right, making things right, making things new for everyone who believes in Him and puts their faith in Him. And when we do that, it leads to holistic transformation for the whole of our lives. And one day we know that King Jesus will return to establish His Kingdom fully here on earth. <music>